Blue tongue virus is transmitted to its ruminant host almost entirely by biting midges, which we call colicoides. So this means it's a non-contagious disease. So if you have an infected sheep, which shows clinical signs of blue tongue, the sheep next to it will not be infected by the virus directly by passing on from one sheep to the other. The virus can only transmit if the biological vector, colicoides biting midges, is around. So the virus then replicates in the insect, and eventually, after a certain time period, it will reach the salivary gland. And once it has reached the salivary gland, the next time this now infected midge feeds on a non-infected suitable mammalian host, so in the case of blue tongue again, ruminants, sheep, cattle, it can then transmit the virus during that blood meal back into the mammalian host. And then the virus starts its replication cycle in this host again. And this is a really intriguing relationship because it doesn't function as a mere needle transmission at all. There's more and more research, for example, that the saliva has a very active role potentially in pathogen transmission because these insects have to salivate to stop blood coagulation and immune responses. Because if so, their saliva is pharmaceutical active, it, co it contains anticoagulants. Because if they otherwise would try to feed, the blood would immediately clot and then you can't take it up. But by having these bioactive molecules in their saliva, they can prevent this blood clotting and they are able to take up a blood meal. Because it is a non-contagious transmission, classical methods we use like preventing contact, restricting animal movement, although they are still necessary, they have a far less impact on a vector-borne disease. Animal movements are important to not dislocate the virus throughout an entire country. So, of course, if you moved an animal from southern England to northern England, you could almost create a second outbreak. However, on a local scale, once the local insect population is infected, they will fly. They will not stop. You can't restrict it. You can't say, excuse me, you are now on movement restriction. So, even if you don't, if you do have animal movement controls, the moment that virus is in the local insect population, you have lost it because it will still be able to be transmitted. Those insects will still fly and infect um, neighboring farms. So this is one of the challenges of dealing with a vector-borne transmitted pathogen. And this is why if you are a free country and you're fearing the incursion of a vector-borne disease, it is so important to catch it early because what you're trying to do is find it and remove those animals or, or at least get them out of being exposed to so many biting insects before the local insect population is completely infected. The Purbright Institute has an insectary where we breed several insect species, so mosquitoes and some biting flies, moxes, citrons, and also colicoides biting midges. In our blue tongue research, which is mainly blue tongue pathogenesis research or transmission research or immune response and vaccine research, we do the vast majority of our work with those mammalian hosts which are really in, which are in nature infected and affected by this virus. So we use sheep, goat and cattle because if you carry out research in something as complex as pathogenesis. So wh where is this virus going and how is it causing disease? Or something like the immune response, which is very species specific. We feel that it is an incredibly advantage to actually be able to use the host which is affected by this disease we would obtain our study animals like sheep or goats or, or cattle from a commercial farm. These are normal um, farm animals. And that the moment they come into our isolation units, they are incredibly monitored. So depending on which type of study we do, we would 
treat them, we would give them painkillers. So one question which is often raised when we talk about our work and describe our work is could we do our research without using animals? So we do a lot of work with primary cell cultures where we just get blood or samples from animals which, which are put down anyway to establish primary cells, to establish organ cultures. And we carry out infection studies of these cells. We even we have um, a project where we also assess the response of these cells to insect saliva to already get an idea what is going on, what kind of cytokines are being made, how do they respond, is there a difference when the virus is on these cells with and without Mitch saliva. So we have developed a method to collect Mitch saliva by making them making them spit into a filter and we can wash off the saliva. So we have a really active project to get our research to a level as far as we can by not using animals. But there's only so far as we can go. When it comes to big questions like transmission, when it comes to big question like is this vaccine safe? Is this vaccine efficient? How does the animal respond upon challenge? We cannot carry out this work without the use of live um, animals. The vertebrate immune system is way too complex that we could ever hope to replicate that fully in, in a model system. There's always going to be a step where we need the animal research because I just, if you just think of how, for example, an insect-borne virus is transmitted with insects blood feeding in the skin, the skin is one of our, it's the biggest organ we have and is one of the complicated, the most complicated organ we have. And then you have blood vessels bringing all these cells and responding and then it gets distributed to the entire body. This level of complexity would almost be impossible to, to, to create in, in an artificial situation. And although you can take it so far and reduce the numbers, which is the ultimate goal, there will always be questions where we need the whole organism. So currently the work we do on blue tongue virus, the, we use about 20 to 30 animals a year. Occasionally when there is an outbreak of, of blue tongue virus, for example, in, in a country where this had never been, or there is a strain which is emerging, which we don't know, then there is the potential to do like an, an emergency study to be able to characterize the pathogenesis of, of this virus and to foster vaccine development for, for this particular strain. There are several vaccines against blue tongue virus and to understand why we are still concerned about developing other vaccines for blue tongue virus, we, we need to look a bit at this virus. So the virus has 27 serotypes. So far we have discovered at the moment, but they keep finding more. And the problem we have is that the protection or the immune response upon either infection or vaccination is serotype specific. So what that means is if, if you vaccinate against BTV8, your sheep and your cow is only protected against BTV8. It is still susceptible to 26 other blue tongue strains. So the vaccines which are available are in Northern Europe inactivated vaccines. That is, they are safe and they are efficient and they have been used successfully to, for example, eradicate blue tongue virus 8 from the UK um, a few years ago. But they are only, they are monotypic, so they will only protect against this strain. Hence, they are fine in a situation where you combat a single strain incursion. It gets more problematic when you are in a country which has several strains of blue tongue virus circling. One big area for the research is to try to find out how can we get a cross serotype protective vaccine. Because in countries like India, where blue tongue virus still has a big impact on subsistence um, farmers, especially in the south, they have 10, 15, 20 strains of, of blue tongue virus circling. So a lot of endemic countries use 
and modified live attenuated vaccines. So they have several strains of live virus. However, it has been shown that they can reach levels which makes them transmissible. So midges can actually pick up the vaccine strain and then testing some of them in British breeds, they also induce clinical signs. So while some indigenous breeds have clearly evolved with the disease and do not get sick to these vaccines anymore, we did not um, use them in Northern Europe because we could show that to certain preparations they would still induce clinical disease in, in the country. So then when we test for antibodies, we don't know does this animal have antibodies because it got vaccinated or does this animal have antibodies because it um, was infected at one point during their life. So that makes control very difficult. And then another area with inactivated vaccines is although if they are applied well in time, they are protect against um, the challenge of the virus, the immune response is relatively slow. So an animal is protected, a sheep probably after three, four weeks, cattle at the moment need two dosages. So that would mean um, probably six weeks until they are protected. So if you think of an emergency vaccination where the virus is already active, you could find yourself in a situation that that induction of immune response isn't quick enough. Developing better vaccine, which might be quicker, might again shorten that risk if you need to use a, a vaccine preparation as, as an emergency response. So these are all drivers for improving the vaccine. Although in a, in a one strain outbreak situation and applied well before the virus really gets going, the current inactivated vaccine available for blue tongue will protect your animals and, and is a good is a good way of protecting um, your animals. Another very important component of this virus, which is crucial to understand, is that it is segmented. So its genome is arranged in segments. And what that means is if two strains of blue tongue infect one cell, they can swap segments, a bit like influenza can. So we create this virus not only creates variation by mutation, it creates variation by changing genome segments, which we call reassortment. The immune response to this virus is monotypic, so it is specifically to the serotype. Other characteristics, however, are strain specific. So we can have a mild or moderate or virulent strain of, for example, BTV1. So when we have a new outbreak, we by serotype have no clue what this strain is going to do. Just because it's a BTV8 strain does not mean it will be a virulent strain. We have to monitor, we have to see, and sometimes we even have to do an animal experiment to understand which, what kind of strain are we dealing with. Is this a virulent strain? Is this a mild strain? How quickly do we need to get a vaccine out? Or if this is a mild strain, can we let this go? And this can obviously change very, very quickly with reassortment. So you could have a mild BTV1 strain circling and a virulent BTV8 strain circling, and then they infect the same animal and suddenly they swap this genome segment, which is responsible for the serotype, let's say BTV1, but then the virulence is on other segments and suddenly you have a new BTV1 because your BTV8 strain has now got that segment from BTV1 but it has remained all the virulence of the other segments which inside really make it BTV8. But on the outside it has now become BTV1. However it still does mutate and it does mutate in this segment, this segment 2, which encodes for the outer code protein, which defines the serotype. And this is why we have 27 serotypes. But the strain landscape is far more complex because it can chop and change all the other segments and therefore render a vaccination campaign useless within the exchange of one genome segment.